Dear Dhamma Diary, I was having quite a lot of introspection lately, and especially this morning. And luckily enough, I was honest enough with myself to find that I'm still an asshole in many ways, meaning that I still have a lot of selfishness and laziness. And, you know, when you think stuff like, oh, I should help my wife to wash up and you don't, but you think about it, but you don't, and stuff like that. Not that I did that, but that's an example. And um, getting off your ass and having some self-discipline uh, or just falling into the temptations of self-deception and um, laziness. And all of these kind of things, or if you tend to anger or you tend to blame others for something that actually is your own fault, or which we all do, we all look for something to blame. Like, you know, you walk in, you stub your toe and split it open, and you blame the sidewalk for being there, instead of blaming yourself for not being careful and not looking, and stuff like that which we call gilesa, his wrong view is uh, defilement and uh, looking through those things and finding my own assholeness where I'm still an asshole but that from doing this although it hurts to find assholeness within yourself and look for the parts of yourself where you're still an asshole hmm? to put in normal speech to put it in Buddhist speech, to find gilesa, where it is, to find the, de find the defilements, which people don't really understand because they don't understand what defilement means. So it's better to just be honest with yourself and look where you're still an asshole and find out what wrong view is along the way because the reason we're assholes is because of wrong views. Um, but to teach most people who are not advanced uh, academics in Buddhism to say to look for the defilement or look for gilesa, gilet in Thai would be to just bore people and with academia which some people love there's some very great uh, students western and eastern students of Buddhism who are very highly studied unfortunately most of them if not all no most of them not all of them um don't actually grasp the Dhamma, they just, un they just have learned and memorized and know how to declare it because they've learned all of the sutras, but they haven't actually seen it with their Dhamma eye. Unfortunately, I noticed this with academics who have just remained with academia but have not. Um, as a monk in Thai, you have two parts, two paths you can take and you can, the best is to do both is Bariyat, Bariyati, which means the academic study of what the meanings of the terminologies are and of the sutras, the teachings of the Buddha and the Vinaya, the rules of the Buddhist canon for monks and for lay persons. And the second one is the Pag Bariyat. So you have Pag Bariyat, the academic study and the Pag Bariyat, which is the practical, the practice, the actually applied practice when you go to practice Gamatan, Vipassana Gamatana, you're not allowed to take the books with you. You are not allowed to pick up a book. You can study books in academia, but when you practice, you don't use a book. You use what you might have understood from the books, but you apply it. And you don't use books because that's head stuff. And practice has nothing to do with head stuff. And so anyway, from this self interest introspection and finding gilesa, finding gilead, the defilements within myself, uh, siding with myself because of the false view of a separate self that you have to self-protect and covet above all others or most others. I don't covet myself above my son, I die for him and everything that's mine is his. So you could say covet yourself above most others or all others depending on the person and learning uh, from looking at myself like this 
It's destroying yourself, it's digging up the shit and finding it inside deep where you deceive yourself, where you hide it from yourself, where you're too lazy to even look at it and really look yourself in the mirror, put yourself in the dock and judge yourself and actually condemn yourself to say, okay, I'm going to wash the plates up before my girlfriend wakes up and she'll be happy and I'll help her to wash because she's got a lot to do today, I'll help her to wash the clothes and I don't have much to do and start doing those things you think you should do but never do would be a good start without real gamatana meditation or anything but it's in meditation that you see these things and in self-introspection is, is a form of meditation being honest with yourself and looking at yourself and the things you do and think and your views and if they're true or not and if they're wrong and admit it to yourself when they're wrong <coughs> that is a self-transformation but then you need also in C you need effort indriya the, uh, the, the faculties and the effort to then get off your ass and actually do what you've realized and know you should do not to just realize it but to then actually do it because to just realize it is like a lotus that's come out of the mud and seen the light but if he doesn't struggle to push roots out and to push himself up into the light he might just wither and die and go back into the mud and become fish food so you have to make the effort and that effort that exertion yeah which is one of the practices of the Eightfold Path uh, right effort is the four right exertions it's called the four samapadana which is to leave the inauspicious deeds of the past behind and um, preserve the good deeds of the past and in the present and future to leave bad deeds behind not not commit them and to cultivate good deeds in the present and future that's the four right exertions which are in truth only two because the past is gone you can't change it your bad deeds you can't change it your good deeds you can't change it but what you can do is try to equalize out your bad deeds by performing more good deeds yeah which um, the performing of good deeds doesn't uh, that uh, um, helps to clear the mind of the baggage of the bad deeds of the past and the avoidance of bad deeds inauspicious deeds now and in the future preserves the good deeds of the past yeah it doesn't spoil the good things you did when you go and do bad things afterwards so by not doing bad things anymore from now onwards and trying to do as many good things as possible from now onwards is two of the four right exertions and in practicing those two things you are also practicing preserving the good deeds of the past and also leaving behind the bad deeds of the past by not doing any more from now on and so from just by not doing inauspicious acts, words, thoughts, intentions and only auspicious acts, thoughts, words, intentions from now onwards you're practicing all four right exertions yeah. and uh, that's a very important part of the Eightfold Path and it's a very important path of changing oneself and getting off your ass and washing up the dishes before your girlfriend wakes up just because it's a collaboration, not a, a contract between two people. And because you want to better yourself and stop being lazy and tricking yourself. And you want to be more selfless. Because there comes a point in meditation where you see that the path that will lead you to Sukhati, that will lead you to that happiness that knows no end, not the transient happinesses we have when we watch a movie and then it's over and it's oh can't wait till the next episode that's just transient happiness but there is a kind of happiness beyond all those what we call happiness that is permanent and it comes with selflessness with self renouncing acquiescing and to renounce the self you have to stop believing in one as we think of one 
And so um, what I noticed about how learning through introspection of myself, I noticed one of my bad aspects is that I get stressed up and angry. I actually suffer PTSD, which is a post-traumatic depression syndrome because of certain events which happened. And that's my problem. I'm not going to go into the details in this podcast. But that's one reason why I feel stress. And I also suffer ADHD, which is uh, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder in adults, which causes me to have a hundred thoughts in the morning before I've even washed my face. And so having PTSD, post-traumatic depression syndrome and ADHD, I wake up thinking about a lot of depressing things, which uh, if I don't have a meditative focused awareness in the sense of the watcher and the thinker, that my brain is thinking lots of ideas with ADHD and I'm depressed with PTSD, so the depressing thoughts and thoughts which can cause depression or anger or stress, thoughts of wrongness against me, wrongness against the world, wrongness against the, the, the ethics of the internet, wrongness of any issue you might dislike, because every person's different. I have my issues, you have yours. So I wake up with a hundred issues. This morning I listened to CNET News about um, disgusting things about Facebook and Google and uh, things that are happening with changes between social networks and new kinds of platforms which are appearing, which are going to make networks like Facebook and Instagram redundant and the wars which are starting between them and the trade wars between countries and all of the politics and it's endless. You can find things to disturb yourself with endlessly. And uh, this is part of a uh, wrong view. With my particularly two illnesses, it is extreme, so I get to notice it a lot. And from the suffering, I've learned to decide to fight it with Vipassana Gamatana, which I've been doing for a long time now. And uh, I found out a lot of stuff through self-introspection of how it happens. And what I've discovered is that thought of the brain will cause chemicals in the thalamus, hypothalamus, and so on, gets sent to the cortex, uh, which then creates and sends um, chemicals to the nervous system. And this then causes you to feel stress or anger or happiness, excited, your heart might beat fast, or fear or whatever. If a buffalo sees a lion, uh, his perception becomes, enters his awareness through the brain. His awareness then, uh, the perception travels back from the awareness to the brain and the brain then begins to think and the thinks, conditioned thoughts of enemy or friend or angry or sad or depressed and whatever it thinks makes chemicals in the brain and these chemicals will cause what we call spiritually an emotion what is actually a chemical being released from the brain through the nervous system of the body yeah uh, into the nervous system from the brain which will make you shake which will make you um, as, a, as a spiritual human you would say feel furious or feel sad, feel depressed feel stressed or excited or whatever and this is actually nature's chemical reaction which has been programmed through evolution for the survival of species that a buffalo reacts with anger to protect its children and so that when you feel anger it's based on what you're thinking because what you're thinking causes chemical reactions to send things into your nervous system and that affects your body and that makes you feel what you think is an emotion which is actually just your nervous system and your body freaking out doing different things doing things what it's programmed to do 
it's not sinful it's nat natural but it's a trap and it's something that you're caught in uh, helpless as an animal it's not supernatural if you are if you're not caught in it then you're supernatural a Buddha is not caught in it and he is supernatural or she is supernatural because uh, has freed themselves from the shackles of those automated reactions because they are automated programmed reactions from the evolutionary process of nature of natural selection and it's to do with perception and views and memory perception and memory and the thoughts of the brain and the chemicals which the brain sends to the nervous system now at the end of the line as the chemicals have hit the nervous system and the body starts to react with stress for example and it's an afflictive emotion I prefer to speak of the afflictive emotions than the pleasant emotions the afflictive emotion of stress if you notice you are stressed and the first thing you do is to focus on look at what my breathing is doing you will see that your breathing has become agitated in one way or another your heartbeat might feel you might feel sick your stomach might ache your head might ache you might just want to sleep you might feel tired all of these different feelings depending depending on your situation tamarum the mood of the dhamma mood depending on the um, particular status of dhamma of the of the natural state of things with you in that moment and um, breathing looking at the breathing and noticing it's agitated I'd like to just sidestep a moment and say that breathing is if you don't focus on it we breathe whether we know it or not because it's an unconscious process your heart beats on its own and you can't control it it's unconscious and you can mostly usually not even be aware of it your liver and your pancreas and your intestines and various other organs some of which I don't even know the names of perform their duties without you ever even knowing they are there you don't have to consciously know and you can't consciously know unless you are supernatural and uh, that's not for this talk and um, I think the only unconscious process which is subconsciously automated which we can consciously not only view and observe but also control consciously is the breath is breathing yeah and uh, that's why the Lord Buddha called the breath the body within the body so if we go back now down the end of the line to see a person who is stressed up and notices that their breathing is agitated and follows the breathing that is agitated to see how it became agitated and see that the agitated sensation which is causing the breath to reflect the agitation through its um, irregular breathing reflects the agitation which your consciousness is feeling which you think is an emotion it's a physical agitation it's your body really making you feel bad and you think it's an emotion well that's what an emotion is and uh, so learning how to control and improve the situation inside the mind and the heart through using the body not just the mind is to use the breath because the breath is the end of the line which reflects the what the chemicals in your body are doing to you in your nervous system and so if you change your breath to a pleasant state then the chemicals within your body which cause the breath to be in an unpleasant state will also change back and be diffused don't believe me you have to practice to try this is my experience I find I can diffuse them I haven't perfected it sometimes it beats me sometimes I beat it but by starting with the breath and reverse engineering it it's 
like if you think about it like this, you know, you think about something good or bad, the brain in the thalamus and the hypothalamus, it sends enzymes or molecules, chemicals, combinations of molecules to the cortex, which in turn sends this chemical formula into the nervous system. <coughs> And uh, then it will make your brain become aware. Memory association will say it's an enemy or a friend. And if it's an enemy, adrenaline will flow through the nervous system. And the fight or the flight reaction will, re will happen, will arise. And uh, the animal's breathing will become excited. So the change in breathing is a reflection of the physical energies due to the chemicals flowing through the nervous system which is a part of nature's way of protecting the survival of the species, as I said. When we are stressed up, if we look at our breathing, we'll see it's agitated. If then we see it's agitated, because of what we were thinking at the time, it will slowly just fade away, and, the, and we will be able to slow the breathing down, which then starts to decrease the chemicals inside the body, which first caused the stress to happen. Because the thing we think of as emotions, uh, we think of it as a spiritual thing, but in truth, it's not just a spiritual feeling, it's a chemical reaction within the body. And this affects the breathing and it makes your heart go fast, or make you start sh uh, shaking, make you start laughing or cry, or your tummy hurts. And so learning to control the breathing can reverse engineer the effects of stress and the chemicals within the nervous system which cause the stress can be doused out. And as I said, that's why the Buddha said that the breath is the body within the body. Because it's the only subconscious process we don't have to think about for it to uh, operate all by itself. Just like our heart beats by itself and our liver and pancreas do their job by themselves, as I said, without us being conscious of them. And breathing is the only unconscious process which we can control with our own consciousness. So that, the breath, is the tool we begin with to use to begin to reverse engineer the process of stress and to transform it by stress I mean dukkha, what Buddhists call dukkha, suffering, and transform it into a peaceful feeling of stillness. So if you're feeling stressed up or unhappy or lonely or sad or depressed or angry, uh, you are suffering. And the Buddha's term was not dukkha, it was dukkha vedana, vedana emotion or uh, uh, feelings. Uh, dukkha is, means like unsatisfactory, dissatisfactory feelings, yeah? We call it suffering. He was talking about dukkha vitana. Vitana is emotion. Emotion is something not physical, it's just name but not form. We have form and name. Rupa is form, nama is name. See, the word name is like nama. Nama is a 5,000 year old word, Sanskrit, and we still have the word name in English which comes from Nama. Yeah, in Thai we call it Nam, means name. Just a piece of academia, Sanskrit academia. Um, and so, uh, we think emotion is just something spiritual and uh, consciousness and emotion scientists can't see it. Because there is no emotion there is a sensation which we call emotion, but the sensation can only happen if you have a body. Because it's a, a chemical reaction within the uh, nervous system, which happens through perception. Perception is like a messenger. Mercury, you know, the winged messenger with the, wing, with the wings on his heels, yeah? With the caduceus wand. He is the god of perception. Did you know that? and uh, telepathy and communication of the music of the spheres through music. Um, so Mercury actually is what the Buddhists call sanya, which means perception slash memory. 
Why, why memory as well? Because if you look at a star, see it explode and it's a thousand light years away, you're actually seeing something that happened a thousand years ago. What you're seeing is a memory. It's not the present, it's already happened. And by the time you're hearing my words, even if you sat in, across the room from me, it might seem instantaneous, but actually there would be a very small time delay as the sound traveled from my mouth to your ear and became processed by your brain and reached your consciousness and was processed and then thought about in your brain and concluded and categorized and conditioned to be this or that, good or bad, friend or agree, disagree, good point, funny, whatever I said. And that whole process takes a split second and so all perception is actually memory. Hmm? And because of memory association, when we perceive something, our brain will associate the perception of what we are seeing or smelling or feeling or thinking, uh, or thinking, not feeling, uh, we are thinking, yeah, or feeling through our body on our sensation, being burned or being stroked, becoming aware of that. When we become aware of that, the brain goes, puts itself into gear and starts thinking and conditioning it through memory association of things it's experienced before. So the smell of strawberries will immediately make uh, the brain think, that's a strawberry. A baby's never heard the word strawberry, he will smell a strawberry, he will like it or not like it, and uh, he won't know anything else. It won't be any conditioning it into a strawberry. There'll be just the experience of the smell of the strawberry. Yeah, that's all conditioned. And that is part of the aggregates. The perception slash memory is the third aggregate. We have five aggregates as a human. Uh, the fourth aggregate is Sankara, which means conditioned thoughts, which means what the brain's thinking. And uh, the fifth one is Vijnana, which means consciousness, awareness of the thoughts or awareness of the event, awareness of the sensation, awareness of the thing your eyes are, are seeing. But the brain is the thing that conditions it, not the awareness. It's the brain that thinks. And sometimes it thinks what it wants and you can't stop it. If you meditate and your mind is still, your brain doesn't stop thinking. It continues with its bullshit. And you're supposed to notice that and watch it. And the bullshit will slowly stop if you watch it for long enough. But you don't stop thinking when you're meditating. You just still your mind and then watch what your stupid old brain, your monkey mind is doing. And notice how monkey-like it is and it will get ever less monkey-like through self-shame without anybody else knowing. You'll just shame yourself into thinking less like a monkey. And uh, so with self-introspection, one can find things within oneself which, like mud on your windshield of your car or shit on, shit on your shoe, you can polish off, finding your own ways of thinking about it and viewing it being honest with yourself and um, if you're stressed up or if you think emotions are something you can't control because they're just spiritual if you see they're connected and caused by what you were thinking about it's what you're thinking about that causes you to have an emotion that this is chemically related and that your breathing will reflect what the chemicals have done to your nervous system so that if you uh, take control of your breath that you can silence any chemicals which are causing your body to think it's feeling a stressful emotion whereas actually the body is just full of chemicals and feels uncomfortable physically and uh, that's your emotions and so I think that's the end of this Quantum Dhamma podcast from Rajan Spencer, signing off.